students are injured in the filming of this class. All right, so here we are, Friday. Once again, we made it. Next week is number six, I think. Are we already there now? And week after that, we're at midterms. How's everybody doing today? All right? Yep. Okay, good. All right, so we're uh, getting our way through acids and base reactions. Does anybody remember, just as a little warm-up thing, better get on camera so people know I'm in the room. Uh, does anybody remember uh, the name of the first uh, definition of acids and bases, or definitions of acids and bases? Uh, without too many pages turning, cause does anybody remember? No. We talked about the Arrhenius definition. Okay, and the Arrhenius definition is uh, basically, an, basically as up your play on words, an acid is a substance that releases what? Hydrogen ions in water, okay? And then we have uh, a base is a substance that releases hydroxide ions in water, okay? Now today we're going to get a, a new definition. The gentleman up there gave this definition I'm about to give right now, so you're, you're ahead of the game. We didn't talk about bronsted lowry did we, last week, last lecture? No, we didn't. All right, so we have the Arrhenius definition. And now we're going to have, should run more clearly here, Bronsted-Lawry definition of acids and bases. Okay, and according to this definition, an acid is a substance. that donates a proton. Okay, let's look at that definition right off. They don't see hydrogen ion, well it's the same thing, it's a proton. Okay, remember, hydrogen atom, proton, and electron, hydrogen ion, just a proton. Now at this uh, new definition, we just start talking about protons. Now we are also saying proton donor. And uh, let me finish up with the base definition, then I'll show you this definition in the previous one, there is room for overlap in some reactions, okay? And sometimes where the reactions are in totally different situations. Let me put down the base now. Is it, what's that? What? What? Bronsted Lowry. How's that? You're welcome. There we go. A substance that accepts a proton. Now, notice right off the bat there's no mention of water, okay? So this frees it up. There's going to be, as I said previously, there's going to be three definitions of acids and bases that you're going to hear about. Okay, there's many, many more, but these are the three that are the big ones that you'll be using a lot. So we get back to reaction like this, and let's make it in water. Bless you. Okay, how's the camera doing here? Oh, my camera crew is, uh, must be on vacation. There we go. Oop. Out of curiosity, if we have equal amounts of both, what do we call this reaction, and what are the products? A neutralization reaction, and what are the products? Water and a salt, in this case it's sodium chloride. Okay? Does that fit on there okay? Yeah, good. All right, now um, let's just look at the uh, definition here. I'm going to give you the net ionic equation of this. It's going to be one hydrogen ion, one hydroxide ion, and that's going to go to one water. Okay, now this does fit the uh, Arrhenius definition. We have hydrogen ion from the hydrogen chlor excuse me, from the hydrochloric acid, the OH from the sodium hydroxide. It's in water. However, this also uh, fits the Bronsted Lowry. Hydrochloric acid, or if you go to the gas phase first, the hydrogen chloride basically is donating the proton. Okay, let me uh, 
be a little bit better about this here. The hydroxide ion is going to have three lone pairs of electrons around it. We'll get more into structure later in the semester. What's going to happen is the HCl donates the proton. The hydroxide is going to basically accept the proton. And let me rewrite the water molecule here just so you can see structurally how that worked. So the hydroxide accepts the proton to produce H2O. Okay? But let me give you another reaction here which does not overlap. If you were to take ammonia gas, so right there we see in the gas phase, not in aqueous, <coughs> and we want to react it with HCl gas, okay, now that is no longer hydrochloric acid, it is hydrogen chloride. It's a covalently bonded molecule. And what's going to give us, what the uh, result's going to be is NH4Cl, and that's going to be a solid. Now let me move over here just a little bit, just to kind of show you what a, uh, come on camera, don't, oh, it's acting weird again. I don't know what its problem is. Okay, well, you guys in the classroom just watch what I'm doing, I'll try to get the camera working. Yeah. Yes. Donating just means it provides a hydrogen ion. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's accepting it. Basically, it's bonding with it. But they like to say donating and accepting. It looks like. Uh, well, I'll just keep the camera on and we'll see what happens if this thing starts working again. I kind of hate to lose the lecture video, but I'm not sure what else we can do here. There we go. Get my chalk going here. Structurally, it's going to look like this. Here's your NH3. It's going to have a lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen. Okay. Now, here's going to be your HCl. Okay. Nothing's ionized. Okay. It's in the gas phase. It's floating around. And uh, what's going to happen here? They're both they're both gases. See, HCl gas and H3 gas. What's going to happen is that nitrogen is basic enough that it's going to pull that hydrogen away from the HCl, and the electron pair that are in the bond is called heterolytic cleavage. What's going to happen is that electron pair is going to stay on the chlorine to make chloride and the hydrogen's going to basically come away, you know, without any electrons until it gets bonded. And then it's going to look like, oop, wrong atom. Then it's going to look like this. And of course, then you can also have a chloride ion with it. Yeah, I think I might have just forget about this camera. I mean, I can do an audio recording now, which won't be quite as exciting, but at least you can hear the lecture. So let's just do that. Okay. Sorry about this, guys. I am not in control of this thing. Um, just quickly, I could try to... No, it's, it's totally frozen again. I guess it is recording, though. Okay. Well, so we'll just have an audio recording then of the lecture. Okay. So you can see the fact that the HCl is donating. This will be the bronsted lorry acid, okay, say so donates electron, excuse me, hydrogen ion, okay, now this guy here is going to be accepting it, okay, so this is going to be the Bronsted-Lowry base, it's going to be accepts like a uh, proton, I'm thinking about electrons all the time, uh, what? Why does it? Because of its structure. It's very what we call basic. Okay, the hydrogen. Uh, it's basic enough to pull that hydrogen away. All right. So anyway, here's our bronsted lorry acid, bronsted lorry base. Everything's in the gas phase. I mean, the two uh, reactants are in the gas phase. The product is in the solid phase, and uh, it does not fit the the uh, Arrhenius definition now. Okay, it only fits the bronsted lorry. Okay, 
And the idea about having more and more definitions of acids and bases is because they fit different situations. Okay, not all chemical reactions happen in water. So they say, well, we can have acid-base reactions in the gas phase, in the solid phase, in non-aqueous, benzene, whatever. Okay? So, anyway, any questions about this part of it? Now, when you get into, just one second, please. When you get into um, equilibrium next semester, and like I keep saying, there's going to be three chapters. The second chapter is on equilibrium pertaining to uh, acid-base reactions. And there you get a lot more into the bronsted lowry uh, definitions. And there you'll be talking about conjugate acids, conjugate bases, and all that, but this book doesn't cover it, so let's just leave that alone. Yes, your question? How does the HCl bonding, how does that donate the H plus? I'm sorry, see, does it, well, it's, it's accepting it, it's, it's back basically ripping it off. So the HCl is donating, it's, it's, it has the, uh, the, uh, the hydrogen proton, excuse me, the proton is basically going to be available because of that molecule. Okay, is that a better way to put it? Yeah, it makes the proton available. The standard definition of they always say donate and accept. Okay, so just to get those down. Yes? Well, because if we, uh, well, let me just put it right here. I've got a little bit of room left, and we're not going to be recording it anyway. Uh, if you have HCl aqueous, okay, what, what happens is the hydrogen, the hydrogen chloride gas, the covalent molecule, bu you bubble it into water, and the water is polar enough that what happens is you get HCl aqueous because here's your chloride, your chlorine, and there's your hydrogen. Okay, Oop, I'm sorry. I'm a little bit distracted because of this camera thing. I was really hoping on getting this. Oh, it says, looks like the touchpad lost connection to its controller. If anybody has a cell phone, they can uh, dial in 687-3846. 687-3846. They'll send, just tell them, our camera's gone crazy. Our touchpad is not working in 201, and they will come down and fix it. You don't have to, but if anybody out there wants to do it, or you can watch me do it. Say again? <laughs> what? Six eight seven, three eight four six. <laughs> That's a two one six area code. Yeah, two one six, right? Okay. All right. Now just call them. Just tell them that an MC two o one. The uh, touchpad has lost connection to the controller, and Doctor Mundell doesn't know what to do with himself. Yes. Could you explain like why that arrow is pointing from the electron to the hydrogen? That's just a convention. That's a convention because it's actually the electron pair that's ripping that hydrogen off. I'm not the one in charge of convention, <laughs> okay? Okay, let me finish this uh, definition here for this gentleman. That might answer those other questions, too. You got your HCl, and then let's look at this as, uh, well, just a molecule of water. Now, water, as we know, is dipolar, okay? It's very polar, actually. It's polar enough that it can pull... Uh, let's see, I should have drawn this a little bit differently. Let's do it like this, maybe. Okay. It can actually pull that hydrogen away from the chlorine. Okay? It'll pull it in this direction like this. Okay? And what happens is this electron pair, because the chlorine is so electronegative, it actually keeps the electron pair. And the hydrogen, as a consequence, you know, comes off as a proton, okay? And then it gets surrounded. Thank you for dialing. Uh, then the hydrogen ion is floating around as a hydrated hydrogen ion surrounded by water molecules. I'll also tell you some more about that in a few minutes. And the chlorine is now also aqueous as chloride. <laughs> Can't take it. This is going to be a fun day, I think. I think I'm just going to go to my office and hide under my desk for the next <laughs> six hours until everything passes. <laughs> All right. All right, in fact, let's get a little more in detail about that hydrogen ion aqueous. I showed you there a mechanism about pulling the hydrogen away, but 
<laughs> when we see this, Oh, that's right. The camera's not working now. Okay. How's that? Okay. Perfect. I should stop it there. When you talk about hydrogen ion aqueous, um, actually what is happening is this. Here is a, a water molecule. It's not the proper shape, but structurally that's what it looks like. Now, when it pulls that hydrogen ion away, the hydrogen ion actually bonds to the water molecule, which gives us something we call H3O, and it's called the hydronium ion. Okay? So when you talk about bronsted lorry, usually they talk in terms of hydronium ions rather than just, you know, protons. Okay? And also it's good for balancing equations when you start doing that kind of stuff <laughs> with acid-base reactions. So, oh, hopefully. did they connect with you? They did. She said she didn't really know what I was talking about, but she had somebody really back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> nice job if you can get it. <laughs> Here we go. All right. So that's your hydronium ion. As far as the arrow going from the electron pair to the hydrogen, that's the way they've always done it. Okay? But just get the idea down that uh, the uh, ammonium, ammonia in this case, is actually accepting Okay, it's pulling it away, it's taking it on, it's accepting the proton. Okay, and the HCl in that case was providing the proton. They call it electron, excuse me, hydrogen, proton, I'm sorry guys, I'm a little bit flustered right now. Uh, proton donor, proton acceptor. Okay, that's how we talk about it now. So now with the Bronsted-Lowry, we don't have to talk about hydroxide ions either. Okay, uh, we, now we have a lot more freedom of what we're doing. Yeah, the hydronium ion is a positive polyatomic ion, okay? And the formal charges, which we'll learn about later, you'll see that the plus is on the oxygen. All right, so let's see if I can gather myself together now to keep going here. Uh, let's see, with the bronsted lorry, we got this and that and the other. He just kind of uh, goes over it fairly, uh, just as much as I just did. And like I said, you'll learn more about it when you get to second semester. All right, so um, hydronium ion, bronsted lowry uh, we saw that there are overlaps. Let's talk about gas forming reactions. I think what I'll try to do is see if I have a previous lecture I did that's fairly similar to today's lecture and just post that up there too for you guys. So, I can't promise it, but let's see what happens. All right, how many of you guys, when you get really uh, bored on weekends, decide to make a volcano out of paper mache using vinegar and baking soda? Huh? Every weekend, yeah. No wonder you're so crazy on Monday mornings. Yeah, all right, okay. Love it. Yeah, you get your little dial and throw it in the volcano. <laughs> yeah, that happens. Anyway, uh, um, what is that? Why is that bubbling occurring? What is that? Is that oxygen or what? Is it actually a volcano we're making? Yes. Yes, she says. She believes. Okay. Well, we don't want to break that that wonderful dream. Um, yes. That uh, here he is, ladies and gentlemen, the star. It's not, let's hear it for him, there you go. It's not connected, see? Okay, now I'm just gonna lecture while he does this, okay? We've been rehearsing this for a week, so let's see how it goes. <laughs> All right, so it's kind of fun if I had a camera on me now because I can roam around and interview people as I'm doing this. All right, um, those gas bubbles are filled with carbon dioxide, and this is gonna be one of the reactions we're gonna look at here. <laughs> okay, now, uh, vinegar, what's the major component? Acetic acid. Okay, it is a weak acid, but still it does give up protons. And it's such a weak acid, we can enjoy it on our salads and all that kind of stuff. Okay, but it breaks down to this. We have that, a hydrogen ion. Okay, we'll make this aqueous. Now, that baking soda, 
is actually this. Okay, bicarbonate or hydrogen carbonate, whichever you like to call it, help yourself. All right, now what happens is, <laughs> as we learned up to our stuff on nomenclature, we got a negative one charge, we can put a proton on that. And by doing so, we come up with this. And who, for the grand prize today, can name that acid? What is it? Carbonic acid. Carbonic acid. Okay. Carbonate, carbonic acid. All right. Now, carbonic, car, carbonic acid. What? Oh, be quiet. <laughs> Wayne. <laughs> Just kidding. Come on. Oh, don't look so serious. <laughs> He's looking around. <laughs> you know, it's the Wayne sitting behind you. <laughs> That's her. Her name's Wayne. <laughs> Parents wanted a boy. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, moving right along here. See what happens when your camera messes up? You lose all kinds of time. And it's Friday, right? Okay, back to work. We're losing. <laughs> Is it me? No, you said we lost time, but there is no clock now. So realistically, we didn't lose our time. I got the time, okay. They like to keep a watch on me. All right, now this carbonic acid is very unstable. Sorry, guys. <laughs> the carbonic acid is very unstable. <laughs> and what's going to happen, it falls apart. It decomposes to give us H2O liquid plus, guess what, carbon dioxide gas. Bubble, bubble. Toil and trouble, okay? That gives you a volcano. All right. Now, let's see what else to tell you about that. Um, if you were to get a beaker of nice, freshly distilled water, what do you think the pH would be? Seven, Seven meaning it's neutral, right? Okay, put a little uh, pH probe in there and just sit back and watch because you've got nothing else to do. Okay, you finish the volcano. All right, now what happens is you can stir the water, just let it sit by itself and see what happens. And it turns out the water will start to get acidic, okay? And that is because if you have H2O, well, there is carbon dioxide in the surrounding atmosphere, the air. H2O and CO2 is going to give you back the carbonic acid. Now, yes, it is unstable and all that. You will have an equilibrium established, but you'll also have a pH there in the water. Okay, especially if you have a closed system, like put them together, close it off, okay, it'll get stable in there, in equilibrium. Is it, is it set up now? I think so. What was the problem? Okay. Great question. Okay. <laughs> Just kicked it twice. I'll have to remember that. Okay. I think it's us. Are you sure? Oh, that's because he turned it off. But my voice still fills the room, right? Yes. Because I'm a trained actor, right? No, I just teach. Same thing, right? <laughs> yeah, just hit, just let's take it up all the way. All the way. Here we go. There you go. Is it moving? Uh, okay, back to the show. Here we go. Um, anyway, the carbonic acid will form automatically. And uh, this, this is uh, an important situation we talk about. You guys taking biology or physiology about the buffer systems and the blood and all that. You got a hydrogen carbonate buffer, as I recall, plus we talk about phosphate buffers. Okay, so CO2 is very important, you know, as far as sustaining life also, as well, not only for plants, but for us too. Anyway, this is our gas reaction. But let's say that we had uh, this instead, carbonate ion. Okay, well now we're going to need two protons. Same reaction. Okay? So that's our carbonate hydro, uh, hydrogen carbonate reaction. And here's another one for you. We have two protons, and we've got one of these guys. And can anybody recognize that polyatomic ion? So should we just forget about this for today? Yeah, it looks like the, the network's flaking out. Communicates with these systems on the yeah. network. So. so it's Friday, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, guys, I'll see if I can find us a video of a lecture just like this. 
so you can watch that. But anyway, it's called the sulfite ion. A few people just joined the class, okay? The other people, you might remember it. And that's going to give us this acid. Can anybody remember the name of that acid? Sulfurous acid, yes. Okay, sulfurous acid, well guess what? Sulfurous acid is also unstable. Okay, and that's going to fall apart to give us water. And in this case, instead of CO2, it'll give us SO2 gas. Okay, so those are the uh, two gas reactions that I'd like you guys to get down. And uh, we've got enough time here to talk about the last thing for today's lecture. Let me put this board up. Explain what? H2O plus CO2, and then it's just no down. Your last one. Yeah, could you explain that? Yeah, you get yourself a beaker of distilled water. It's just pure distilled water. Yeah. You get the pH at 7. It's neutral, okay? Neutral pH. Now, if you just watch that, I mean, you can stir it just to kind of speed the process up, or just watch it, it'll slowly get acidic, okay? Not real acidic, but just it'll start to go south, okay? Like pH 6, something like that. Uh, the thing is, it's because the CO2 in the atmosphere, that will be this, mixes with the water to give us back carbonic acid, or to give us carbonic acid, which of course will bring the pH down. Not tremendously, it's not like we're making concentrated uh, hydrochloric acid or anything. Okay? Okay. All right. All right, let's finish this up talking about titrations. Okay, now we're to we'll be focusing on acid-base titrations. There are other types too. But let me uh, begin not with a definition, but just with an example. Okay, suppose you have a container here, a small beaker, and it has, you know it contains HCl, and it's got unknown concentration. Okay? Unknown concentration. <laughs> now, let's say we have a specified volume. Let's say we have 125 mils of the HCl. So we know the volume, but we want to find out the concentration. Okay, now what are the two units, when we're talking about molarity, what are the two units we need? Moles and liters, right? So basically, we'll be using titration here to find molarity, which is going to be moles per liter. In fact, let's say liter of solution. And in this case, we'll say moles of HCl. Okay, we're going to have to find the number of moles of HCl. Now, to perform this, <laughs> well, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a neutralization reaction with HCl. And we know the reaction. That's the main thing before you do a titration. You have to know what you're titrating, and you have to have a particular reaction in mind that you're going to follow. <laughs> we know, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. We know for every mole, if you like, of HCl, it's only going to take one mole of, let's say, sodium hydroxide to neutralize it. And that's the name of the game, neutralization here. I'm going to give a sodium chloride aqueous. All right? So the thing is, knowing that reaction, if we want to find the number of moles of HCl, well, we could neutralize the solution using a certain number of moles of sodium hydroxide. And, we'll, and we know the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. Okay, now the relationship is going to be a one-to-one, -one, right? So if we can neutralize this solution, we know how many moles of sodium hydroxide it took, then therefore we know how many moles of HCl were in the beaker. So now we have moles, we have volume, we have concentration. All right? So, um, the way, <coughs> physically, the way this thing is set up, here's our container with the HCl. And we use a burette, graduated cylinder. It's going to have little lines in it. Okay, it's called a burette. And the burette contains the titrant. Okay, in this case, the titrant is going to be sodium hydroxide. 
and we'll say known concentration. What I mean by known, I'd say at least a couple to three or four decimal places. Okay, we really want to make it precise here. So this is going to be known concentration. Okay? So what we do is we drip in the hydroxide into the beaker with the HCl until the HCl is neutralized. And then we stop. And then we can figure out, if we know the concentration of the sodium hydroxide, Okay, I'll put it up here again in case it's a little ambiguous. If we know the concentration of the sodium hydroxide and we keep track of the volume that we put in, well, what do we have then? If we have volume times concentration, it's going to give us moles. Okay, volume will be in, uh, well, we'll say liters. You can always change from milliliters to liters. Concentration is going to be moles per liter. That's going to give us moles. Okay? Now the question is, how do we know when we hit neutralization? Some of you guys have done titrations. What do you think? What's that? You can use a pH meter. A very, uh, a very uh, popular way, if you can't afford a pH meter, is to use an indicator, which will turn color at a certain pH. And I say at a certain pH because we're not always talking about pH of 7. We're going to find out that some of these salts that are formed in different types of neutralizations, some of them can be neutral, okay, like sodium chloride. Some of them can be acidic, as the ammonium ion is. Okay, and some of them can be basic, like the acetate ion. Okay, so basically we hit, it goes basically again. Basically, when you uh, neutralize something, depending on the nature of the salt, the pH does not have to be 7. It could be above 7 or below 7. So if you're going to use an indicator, you have to be very selective which, which indicator you want to use. Now, a lot of times we use thing of failing, which actually has 9 as the pH. But the thing is, as you'll learn, there's a very steep curve. And if you get the color just right, you can just pinpoint it on a 7. But the thing is that using an indicator pH meter, and you can also use what? like temperature perhaps, because neutralization would be, in this case, an exothermic process. You could look at the temperature change. I think pH is a little more direct way of doing it, though. Or color change this way, which, which is also pH dependent. So if we're going to do this, let's just quickly set up a problem here. Let's say we have a... Uh, And it's a one-to-one -one relationship, so if you know how many moles in the volume, excuse me, you know the concentration of your sodium hydroxide titrate that you're putting in. You know the volume that you put in. So if you multiply those two together, it gives you the number of moles of sodium hydroxide, and the relationship of the moles of sodium hydroxide to HCl is one-to-one. -one. So it's the same number of moles. Okay, and that picture that you drew, could you explain it really bad? Which picture? What, uh, what, what did you figure out? What? This picture? The sodium hydroxide is in the burette. Okay. okay. You turn this, this thing's called a stopcock. It's just a little valve to open it up. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to get way into the technique of, you know, drop by drop. But let's just say you just put enough sodium hydroxide in here if you're using an indicator until you see the color change. And then that tells you you're well, neutralized. We what? So what we did in the lab. That That's what we're talking about. Yeah. We're just reviewing it a little more in depth now. Depth. Okay. All right. So if we have unknown HCl, but it has 125 milliliters. Okay. Titrant. Let's stick with the sodium hydroxide. TRA. Good Lord. Have a bad Friday. Titrant's going to be sodium hydroxide. And let's just say it's a 1.0 molar solution. Okay? Now let's say that when we did this titration, we had an indicator in there, and we stopped at, a, let's say, 23.0 milliliters sodium hydroxide, okay, uh, to neutralize. Okay? So what we do now is we just take 
the volume and the uh, concentration of the sodium hydroxide. Oop, let me get my calculator out. And find the number of moles of sodium hydroxide that it took. And we should just be able to finish the lecture now. I'm sorry today's, we lost a lot of time today. I'm very sorry. I know I joked around about it, but I was just trying to leave my own tension. Uh, let's see. So if I say moles, sodium hydroxide is going to be equal to, uh, let's see, we have 23 milliliters. Let's turn that into liters. So it's 0 0.023 liters times, and our concentration is just going to be 1.0 moles per one liter of solution, okay? So it's going to be basically 0 0.023 moles of sodium hydroxide. Okay, now we know that it's going to be a one-to-one -one relationship, which means we have 0 0.023 moles of HCl. Now we also know the volume of the HCl. That's going to be uh, 125 milliliters. So that'll be 0.125 liters solution. Okay. So to finish it up, this problem is 0 0.023 divided by 0.125. And I come up with 0.184 molar HCl, okay? Like I say, uh, we usually just hear about titration in regards to acid-base reactions, but, you know, we can also use redox reactions, things like that, whatever works. Okay, guys, uh, let's just end it right there. I'll, I'm going to look around for a video to cover the material more in depth. And you guys have a good weekend, and I'll see you on Monday. What? Yes, just a second, please. Yeah. So when it comes to the gas forming reactions, and you said that these will like interchange because of the stability of this? Yeah, it just falls apart through the years. So in the full equation, can we put the Yeah, I was just saying like you make a volcano, that's going on. Oh, excuse me, just that's going on. Because okay. this is all being lost in the atmosphere. But let's say uh, not a volcano, let's say you had a jar and you combine the two together and screwed the jar down. But what happened is this would be produced, but also you'd have a reverse reaction to give you back carbonic okay. acid. I mean, it's going to, they're going to be in equilibrium, so it's not like all of this is going to go away. It's just going to be this. So it's this going, is only in certain scenarios that it'll be no. interchangeable? No, no. Well, we'll interchangeable. We call this a decomposition. Okay. okay. It's from here to here. All right. Now, the thing is, like, you know, in the body and everything, unless you're basically losing the CO2, or let's just think of a closed system like a jar of a lid on it. You're going to produce this, but then what's going to happen is it's going to establish an equilibrium with both of these present at the same time. Okay. okay. But when you make the volcano, you're not talking about a closed system. So you make this, it'll fall apart. See, if you start losing the gas to the atmosphere, even though the water might hang around, but even that's going to be kind of open, you're not really going to see a very strong reverse reaction okay. at all. You know, maybe a little bit of CO2 in the atmosphere will restore this a little bit. But, okay. but if it's, like I say, if it's a closed system, this is what you're looking at. If it's you're making a volcano this weekend, that's the way it's going to go. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Shot. Get some paper machine, right, okay? Okay, yeah. I wanted to review my exam. Are you going to be in your office? I'll be in my office. I'll be, well, when I finish all this, I'll be in my office. Okay, okay. thank you. All right. Yes. What was your good exams? You love it, but you can't cover it. It's like you love French movies, but you don't speak French. Right? I have a question. So is the M with the HCl? Yeah. It means the HCl has a concentration of 1.84 moles per liter. You still have chemistry? There you go. Now you can look at it. Thank you so Come on much. Over here. Okay. There you go.
So in these reactions, the electron comes from this. I'm just, like the arrow just confuses me because it says like. No, well, yes, this is just a convention. When we get to organic, you're going to be seeing a lot more. Are you going to be seeing a lot Okay, so you will go to organic. Yes. This is, see, the thing is, these electrons are basically tearing this hydrogen away. Okay. Now, we'll say the nitrogen accepts it, but it's a very ex aggressive acceptance. You know what I mean? It says, come here, pulls them off. And what happens is because the HCl is so electronegative, it's like 3.5, it's the second highest one on the periodic, no, excuse me, no, oxygen is, uh, this one's like 3.0. Um, but still electronegative enough that this bond here is made up of two electrons. And rather than having this thing where you have these two electrons, let's look at them like this, these two atoms like this, um, usually two atoms will each donate one electron to make a bond, okay? Now, that's fine, but in this case, when the bond breaks, instead of the hydrogen taking one electron and the chlorine taking one electron, the chlorine is so electronegative, it's going to take both electrons and leave the hydrogen, you know, all by Doesn't that make it very unstable, that the hydrogen, if it has no electron, or what, what well, is the that? the electron is, well, in this case, it's the, hydrogen, the hydrogen here, yeah. the hydrogen here, yeah. even though it's using the electron pair, it's also picking up bond to the nitrogen, which yeah. stabilizes mm -hmm. it even more. So the yeah. H plus actually comes from this one and goes to this one. Yeah, but okay. what happens is the H plus accepts, you know, the electron pair okay. in this bond. So it's not H plus pair. In fact, it's probably more of a transitional thing. As the, as the hydrogen is pulled away, it becomes more and more positive. But the, uh, the nitrogen is actually pulling it away and forming a bond. So it doesn't, it, it does not form a, a distinct... H plus floating around by right, itself. It's, kind of it's a transition. Right. It goes from mm -hmm. H bonded here to H yeah. bonded here. Okay. But there is a point in the transition where it becomes you know, more positive and then it restores its neutrality. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I'll try to like Google a YouTube video or something to see it. I'm a very like visual person, so well, I need come to like, see well, it. Come, <laughs> come to my office because okay. I'm very visual too. Okay. And maybe you can visualize this, okay? okay? Right. But uh, no, I'll, I'll show you a little bit. Some more drawings, okay. but today's lecture I'm not really happy with it all. This I wasted too much time today, but, but we had a good time. Right? Yeah, yeah. Are you in your office after this? Yes, uh, I'll be up there in about 10 to 15. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. That's where I'm going to do. And then I'll see you there too. And how about you? I was wondering if I don't mean to bug you, if you had a chance to. I tried to do it yesterday. I really, 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 really did. And every five minutes it seemed like some new problem was coming through my door. And so I, I always have to tell my students that, you know, if you do take a makeup test, uh, sometimes I can get it done really quickly, but sometimes it actually sits for a week. Sometimes even more. Okay, I'll be patient. I'm getting ready to do the Ingenuity Festival tomorrow, which means today I'm going to be scrambling around gathering things up. I'll try to get it done today because it makes I do feel bad about not finishing. It's no problem. But you know, I just got to do it. I'll be patient. You be patient, or I'll be patient. Yes, oh, ladies sorry. and gentlemen. No, no, that's fine. Okay, okay. Uh, where is your office? SI three three two. Three three two. Is that just the building right next door? <laughs> follow her. Okay, I'll follow her. Yeah. All right, thank you. <laughs> Okay. Um, yes. So, since your office hours are usually just right after this class, but I have a class like this class, like I just, literally just sit in here right after I've been anatomy. Too much class. <laughs> I know, right? Um, I wanted to ask you: um, Can I make an appointment with you to pick up my exam? Yeah, I'll, I'll or be, uh, today will be a little bit crazy. But, it, no, but I don't if have you to do by, it today. But well, like I'd Monday, say if you want to, I would suggest coming like. Because uh, I end today at twelve ten. Oh, well, I was about to say, well, I'll teach until 1.15. Oh, okay. But, uh, uh, what time do you get here on Monday? Is it just 9.10? Oh, yeah, don't come see me before class on Monday because I'll be just, I'm usually getting here just about 20 minutes before class and trying to do about two or three things before class starts. Oh, okay. Um, usually, if you can't make it during office hours, you can catch me about 1.30. Uh, if you come by, uh, I'll try to help you at 1.30. You just want to pull your exam, right? Yeah, I just yeah, I yeah. just wanted to try one thirty today. Okay, because okay. I'll be finished my afternoon lecture and I'll be running around a little bit, but I can take. A few I know minutes. I have I have the chem lab on Mondays, and I you usually work? see you walking. Um, like I might be to your office. 
on Mondays because my I said what my um, on Mondays my uh, lab starts at one thirty. Oh. Okay. Well. See, my schedule sucks. I can't. It sucks. I hate it. <laughs> Why don't you do this? You'll, prob you want, you'll probably you'll probably me. get here to lab like five minutes ahead of time. Yes. Knock on my door, okay. give me all your information, then go to lab and I'll see what I can get for you. Okay. Okay. Thank Let's you so much. That. All right. Uh, okay, sir. I'm gonna head off now. Is that okay? I'll try this again at noon for my next class. Thank you. 